Hello, folks. Welcome back. Today, I have been listening to the Twins uh, actually win a game, something unfortunately pretty rare this season. But I want to take a break from that and revisit something we've talked about on this channel before, and that is dial silvering. I'll put a link into the video of the series I did uh, nine months ago or sometime. And I wanted to revisit it because I have participated in the Minnesota Clockmakers Guild session where we did uh, another dial silvering project. In this case, I did the chapter ring of our Win Stanley here, and I wanted to apply that same mechanism to the rest of the dial. And there were a few things that were suggested in the Clock Guild session that have not been things I've been used uh, before and wanted to just share those and see how they work, and perhaps that would be something that would work for you. By the way, if you are in Minnesota, I highly recommend you joining the Minnesota Clockmakers Guild. It's a great group of folks and a lot of knowledge to share. If you are outside Minnesota, there are guilds uh, and various other organizations from the NAWCC in probably almost every state. And so if you go to my website, minnesotawatches.com or minnesotaclocks.com, I have a resources page where you can find links to some of those groups. I highly recommend you check those out. Anyway, the basic process of dial silvering is the same as what I have shown before, but we'll recap that so you don't need to revisit that. And that is uh, dials that are silvered are actually brass. You can see the unfinished crusty side on the bottom there. And how the silvering process works is you have to get rid of the um, oxide layer of the brass by sanding down, and then you use a two-part process. Um, this is a kit produced by Time Savers out of Arizona. You can do this with your own chemicals if you want. Step number one is silver chloride, and this is the uh, first step where you smear this on your clean brass, and it is an ion exchange reaction where the silver from the silver chloride trades places with the copper ions in the top layer of brass, and that actually deposits a very, very microscopically thin layer of silver. Now, interestingly, that actually doesn't look that great. It looks kind of peanut butter brown. And so step two of the process is this um, cream of tartar. And this is the same cream of tartar that you might find in your kitchen. And you apply this after applying the silver chloride. And then that brightens the brass to look like this. Now, brass dials that were silvered, this clock is very old, about 1750 or so. They were engraved by hand and or machine, depending upon the circumstance and the era. And so the engraving of this is actually recessed. I don't know if I can show you that easily in the, in the camera shot here, but that all of the, uh, the minute markers and all of the other engraving are recessed. And the way that we get these nice uh, high contrast black numerals is to use engraving wax. This is um, also available from Time Savers, and I learned from the uh, Minnesota Clock Guild that you can get similar sticks like this that are you know, on the order of uh, furniture repair um, wax sticks, and these are a, uh, a lacquer-based process. It's not really wax, it's closer to a color crayon. And that, using some heat, you can melt this into the numerals and then um, using a combination of some isopropyl alcohol to clean up some extras, scraping with a uh, stick like this to get the excess off while, uh, while your part is still hot. And then some sanding um, removes the last of the excess wax. And then what was done here was a circular sanding pattern I've made a jig to do that, which I showed in my previous video. And that gives kind of a grain, which is going to contrast to this. So um, if you have not seen the engraving wax process, you can go jump ahead to my earlier series. I'll put a note in the video for that. Um, today, I want to carry on the process. And this particular clock, the uh, center of this clock dial was actually silvered as well. So we're going to work on that. We're also going to work on the calendar wheel, and I think that's going to look real nice. 
The test as to whether the center of a dial should be silvered is the texture. This is a fairly flat finish. There are, the other clock that I showed in the prior silvering series had a dappled backdrop, and that would be a good indication that that was supposed to be brass. But in this clock, I have it on good authority that the center of this dial would have been silvered with the same engraving being black, and then that would be a very nice high contrast look. And the outside of the dial would have been brass colored. And so I have uh, already removed the spandrels. Those have been cleaned up and we'll attach those at the end of the video. Looking at this, the engraving is in pretty good condition. That was not the case for the chapter ring. This was a mess. So like in the first video I did, I ended up scraping out all of the old wax, which had hardened into just almost dust and then did a complete re-wax job using heat and the engraver's wax. I'm going to attempt to use the, um, the wax that's already here. I think it's in good enough condition at least to give it a shot. Uh, it may look a little different than the main chapter ring, and we'll uh, look at that here and see if it's good enough the way that it is. One thing about the center section is I want to have a linear grain pattern in the final finished brass as opposed to the radial grain pattern in the main chapter ring. So we're going to use some sandpaper and we're going to finish cleaning this up. Um, I'll uh, insert a, a picture of the before of this dial and it was really gross. In some ways it was kind of cool. I actually liked the patina and debated whether I wanted to actually do it, but I, I do think dial silvering is so cool that it's worth the work and it's going to be a different but still very cool result. So we've got some of the prep in, and what's left really is the differentiation between the process I showed in my prior videos and the steps of the Clockmakers Guild. So we'll go ahead and get started here. I'm going to start with some 400 grit sandpaper, and I'm going to try to work in as straight a line as I can, and we're gonna to try to remove the rest of the tarnish, and then we'll see what kind of grain looks good. Actually, I might start with more like 300 grit sandpaper, 320. Um, brass that is engraved like this is pretty resilient. You can actually sand on it fairly aggressively and you're not going to uh, wear into the engraving that much. Uh, that is not necessarily the case for a relatively modern brass style that's been silvered, but this is good old, uh, almost 300 year old brass and the engraving is nice and deep. So uh, we don't have to baby it too much so we'll get going on that. I've got a little knob that I have to kind of work around here. It is coming off. Sanding block helps me keep it sort of flat. Taking longer strokes helps get rid of the start and stop marks. This is moderately forgiving um, when we do our final green pass. That'll be coarser than this, so I'm more concerned with getting all the way through the tarnish, because if we don't do that, you know, in these darker areas, the silvering won't stick there. The chemical reaction will be inhibited by the oxidized brass. So um, you can tell how you're doing, like if you look on the side here, where the brass is yellowed, that is too oxidized. The, the silvering process isn't gonna take there. Where it's shinier and brighter, that's, that's gonna be where it's gonna work. And so I've got some of these darker lines here um, you can make a determination on how much patina you want to have show through your silvering. Um, right now, if I left it like this, that would show as darker lines. And if you like that, you can leave it. If you want to make it more pristine looking, you can keep sanding. Uh, in my case, I'm going to go a little farther. I definitely have to get rid of the, um, the tarnished brass that's still in a few locations here. And I'm going to try to um, clean mine up just a little bit more. I think this is cleaned up to the level that I'm comfortable with for now. Um, you can see there's some damage in the brass that if I try to sand through that, I'm gonna lose a lot of material and it's gonna take forever. So I think that is gonna be about where I'm gonna stop. Um, I want to make sure I've got uh, a good uh, track around the um, the calendar marker here just because that should be silvered as well. So I'll touch that up before I go on. But then we're going to uh, try to put the green on and see if we can make this 
look a little better. You can see the arc of my hand as I kind of sanded this, so I'm gonna to try to do a little better job when we put the final grain on to try to keep that as straight as I can. Here we are after the graining. I used 150 grit sandpaper for that. Uh, I think I'm reasonably happy with this. It's always challenging without uh, popping out this rivet to make a hole like that perfect. But again, we have a little bit of tolerance because the clock's almost 300 years old. I'm gonna rinse this off and get rid of any of the sanding debris, and then we'll start the silvering. The dial is rinsed off. I've left it wet. You actually need a little bit of water for this process, so I've got just a tiny bit in a container here. And how I'm going to apply this is the same way we did it in the last video. I'm going to use a cotton ball mixed uh, with the powder and a little bit of water to make kind of a paste-like substance. And we'll do step one first, the silver chloride followed by the cream of tartar to brighten it. In my last video series, somebody gave me a hard time for not wearing gloves, and uh, that's fine. Gloves are great. Uh, gloves were not used when this dial was first silvered in 1750, and it really isn't a problem as long as you don't touch the final stage of the silvering uh, between then and when you coat it. My hands have been washed just a minute ago. There's hardly any oil on them, and we're going to do multiple stages of washing. So. I'm going to continue with my fingers, but if gloves make you more comfortable, more power to you. By the way, if you ever get confused which is which, this is the silver chloride is the one that looks like table salt. The step two cream of tartar is much finer. It's more like baking powder. So I'm going to rub this on here. I'm using just a little bit of water and I'm using some friction to kind of work the silver chloride crystals into the dial and we should see a very subtle color shift happening here. There we go, a little bit more water. And the spokes of the dial are behind the main chapter ring, so I'm not worrying about that. I am just worrying about the center section which needs to be silvered. And as I mentioned, this the uh, end result of this first step is not something that looks especially silver. It's just kind of a different color of gray-brown. And that's what step two fixes. So I'm gonna just continue around the dial. The engraving is standing out nicely. So hopefully it will be something that we can save and I won't feel compelled to redo that because that is quite a bit of work. You should be able to see the color change happening in just relatively few seconds, and you can play with the amount of water and silver chloride um, to get the most effective result here. I had trouble in a previous dial where if you leave these silver chloride crystals in one place, they can actually create a mark in the surface, so I would uh, go around and you know, periodically touch up the, the places that the silver chloride crystals have been sitting so you don't end up with little dots on your dial. Okay, there is the end of step one. I think I've got good coverage there. The color looks uniform and kind of the muddy brown. It does look a little bit silver under this lighting, but in real life it's not uh, as silver as it looks on the camera. I've made sure I've gone all the way around the center section and up the spokes just a little bit so that I'm sure that everything that is going to be exposed inside the main chapter ring is good. I'm gonna go take this to the sink, rinse it off, and we will do step two. Step two is our cream of tartar. Oop, that's plenty. This is a more dramatic change in color than the silver chloride. It doesn't, of course, change color unless you've done the silver chloride step because the silver chloride is what actually puts the silver onto the brass, but the cream of tartar is what actually makes it look like silver. The nice part about this process is if something doesn't take, uh, you can, as long as you don't lacquer this or you know put some kind of protective coating that you've got to sand off again, you can go back and, and revisit this. Uh, can, if, if a spot is not 
coming out even, I can go back and hit it with a little sandpaper to expose some, some new um, unoxidized brass and re-silver and then do our second step over again. That is no problem. What should be happening is this should be turning uniformly silver and it looks pretty good. Again, and I talk about this all the time on this channel, uh, I sometimes struggle with where is good enough and uh, on a clock that's 300 years old, 275 years old, I think there is a place where good enough is good enough and a little bit of patina is actually desirable so that people can appreciate the fact that it wasn't made last week and sold at the furniture store. So I'm okay with some minor imperfections here and there, but I do want the silvering to come out as evenly as it can, uh, apart from the nicks and dings that are part of its history. So I think this is looking pretty good. I will go rinse this off and I will be right back. I think this looks pretty good. So you're asking me, okay, so what's different than the last time? These are the same steps that you showed us in the previous video series, and that is true. And that brings us to our first point of difference that uh, was discussed at our clock guild. And that is using baking soda as a third step to neutralize any remaining uh, chunks of the uh, cream of tartar, which is acidic. Um, doing this just reduces the likelihood that there would be any uh, reaction spots in the future. I can show you one that I believe happened on the dial I did in the prior YouTube video. It looks like a little rusty brown spot. And so this uh, baking soda neutralizes any of the remaining acid and that hopefully will um, prevent any kind of blooms from happening. And baking soda is cheap, so I'm using this liberally, trying to get it everywhere in here. And again, I'm okay touching this with my hands through this step because I'm going to rinse it again. And the total elapsed time between when I sanded and when I'm doing this now is about 10 minutes, and I've washed my hands about four times in that period. So wear gloves if it makes you more comfortable, but I think we're going to be fine. All right, I'm going to rinse this off. We are back, and this is rinsed off. It's still wet, but I think it looks really good. And I'm going to just dry this off with a clean rag, and I'm going to put it in my drying oven and uh, just to cook all the water out of it here. And that's going to bring us to difference number two from the earlier video series I did. And in that series, we used Renaissance wax as our protective coating. This time we are going to use an acrylic lacquer. This is Rust-Oleum Painter's Touch. And if you look up the material safety data sheet uh, and the, there's a technical specification document that you can find online, it says the base of this is acrylic and that is compatible with the Time Savers lacquer. Uh, there are some cases that depending upon what you use for your engraving, your protective coating may actually dissolve that and you have streaks, but uh, this uh, Rust-Oleum clear lacquer is compatible and it's a nice easy coating to put on. And I'm told from colleagues of mine that have used this for a long time that it is long lasting and doesn't yellow. Here we are in our horological grade spray booth and I have the Rust-Oleum clear lacquer now, this is the matte version. It also comes in a gloss version. And I like, I think, the matte for silver, but I'm going to attempt to do some more work on the corners where the spandrels are here. So I'm going to try to take some care to only spray in the center section, and I'll be sanding, so it's not that big of a deal if I get a little overspray. But I'm going to try to stick to the middle. This stuff dries quickly, and so uh, light coats are the way to go here. I repeated the process we just saw on the calendar wheel here. The only difference is I used my uh, circular sanding jig to recreate the grain pattern that is radial around the, the gear. How the circle sanding jig works is there is a uh, pivot point in the middle and I've engraved concentric circles and use this 
spatula to um, put sandpaper on. This is fairly flexible, and this allows me to contour the sandpaper around um, any different thickness material or sometimes uh, angles, and I can create radial sanding strokes. So with the circle sanding jig, I, I created the grain on this and then silvered it as we discussed. You'll notice that there's some junk in the middle that isn't silvered. That was a conscious decision that is not visible through the aperture of the dial and would have taken a lot of material removal to clean that up. Um, so I think this is going to be okay. The only thing that is a little bit less than perfect is this tooth repair where for some reason I didn't do enough preparation or, or something and that didn't get silvered. But I think it's still going to look great. The only task we have is to look at the non-silvered parts of the dial and try to make that look good underneath the spandrels. Here we have the center section of the dial that we just silvered, the main chapter ring, which I uh, did prior to the beginning of this video, and then we have the unfinished brass corners of the dial. Uh, what goes here are these spandrels, and they just line up like this. Uh, what you can see here is the condition of this dial plate. On the edges here, this is actually very deep corrosion. Um, I want to make this look somewhat better, but here again is the, the challenge of deciding how far do you go? How much material removal am I going to be okay with to try to get all of this out? So I have done some work on it, uh, and it certainly looks better than the original condition picture that I linked in the video, but I think we can find a middle ground between its current condition and uh, removing half of the brass to get it to be clean. And here we are at the end of the line. I sanded the rear of the dial down to 800 grit and left some of the deeper spots, um, some of which are actually hidden by the clock case, so that's, that's a nice thing. Spandrels are back on and it is running. So this is really a great clock. And here is Win Stanley in all of his glory. Now it has a dial in good enough condition to match the rest of the clock. Thanks for watching.